Welcome to Conversations with Des. I'm your host, Des Blanchfield. Today I'm joined by Keith Nielsen. Keith is the technical evangelist for CloudSphere. Keith, welcome to the show. Great to have you here today. Yeah, thanks, Des. Nice to be here. Thank you. Great to see you. So, folks, today we're going to be talking about a number of key things around the cloud world. We're going to be talking about AWS cloud migrations for enterprise, and in particular, the significance of CloudSphere recently achieving both AWS migration and modernization competency, and AWS cloud management tools competency in the cloud governance category. We're also going to discuss what achieving AWS migration and modernization competency means for CloudSphere customers. And we're going to be talking about CloudSphere's unique approach to discovery and planning for AWS migrations uh, rooted in proper cyber asset management. But before we do that, Keith, I wonder if, uh, before we dive into today's talking points, if we could just maybe do a little segue sideways and get a little insight from you as to what a day in the life of Keith Nielsen's like, and uh, maybe you could tell us a little about your role as technical evangelist for CloudSphere and some of the key focus areas for your role. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, thanks again for having me, Des. So, uh, I'm the technical evangelist for CloudSphere, um, and I'm responsible for actually a number of different activities across the business. Um, my role helps me to help a number of different areas and departments across the company. So, um, you know, typically speaking, I, I lead competitive analysis, so I very much sit beside and help product. Um, my role is actually grounded in the marketing department, um, so I help with product marketing. I support and build out collateral. Uh, I do support the, the sales team that we have here, which is obviously on the, the front line, speaking to our customers and prospective customers and partners. And I do actually help with partner enablement. So I have a role that kind of traverses different areas of the business. Uh, and I typically tend to relay the trends that we're seeing in the market uh, that we're seeing through the field with our with our customers that we're working with. I feedback use cases. I'm, I'm gathering use cases that perhaps we need to explore ourselves in the market and feedback into the business. And the other thing that I do is I technically lead the relationships with our cloud providers uh, and, and, and system integrator partners. So I've got a, a role that kind of is a, a bit of a journeyman, really. Um, and like I said, I sort of traverse different areas of the business, but uh, that, that's typically what I get up to. Sounds like a fantastic role. Uh, I should uh, submit my CV. I, um, I, I, I imagine most people would be very envious when they hear that, that, that you've got such a challenging and, and broad reaching role that you get to do a number of interesting things on a regular basis. And if anything, at the moment, sure. there's no such thing as a normal day, is there? So we're looking for a fun challenge. Well, today That's we're going to be covering a number of really key topics. I wonder if we can kick off uh, initially, as we spoke about earlier, uh, starting with an overview of what achieving uh, AWS migration and modernization competency means for CloudSphere customers. I wonder if you could provide us an overview of what that achieving that means, and, and in particular, from your customer's point of view. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, people may or may not know, but um, AWS actually have a number of stringent programs, competency programs in, in actually a number of different domains and disciplines. Uh, one of them, and, and they tell me one of the most stringent ones is actually the uh, cloud migration competency. And the, the, the premise of these programs is to um, provide assurance to the market, to our customers, to prospective customers, to partners that are looking at solving uh, cloud migrations. Um, and really what it does is it demonstrates that the product and indeed the company has actually gone through a really stringent due diligence process. So AWS essentially ensures that you know, what we say we do, the product does. Uh, and that's not just the, the actual technical product itself. That is the people behind the product. It's, it's the CloudSphere team in, in all walks of life. Um, and so really what it is, is, is almost like a little bit of a, a rubber stamp to say that you know, we meet the requirements, we, we meet and we adhere to AWS's standard in terms of what's needed to support a migration to AWS and all of the use cases that surround that. So it's, um, it's a really great achievement. We're very proud um, to be able to say that we have that. And like I said, it, it, it just you know, provides some confidence and credibility in terms of our technology being a really, really good selected fit for the use case of migration. Um, and one thing I will just quickly add to that is that one unique that we have actually in the market is that we also hold the competency for management tools in the cloud. Um, so within the cloud governance category, we also have a competency there. And that obviously is akin to our, our actual proposition in the market is that it's, it's cloud migration, but it's also governance in the cloud. No, congratulations. It is indeed, as you said, a significant achievement and, and, and should be recognized as such. And, uh, you know, over the last two years in particular, uh, in, in 2020 and 2021, 
uh, we've seen such an enormous uplift in, in the adoption of cloud, and particularly a combination of, of software as a service and infrastructure as a service where people haven't been able to get to their own data centers. And so they've deployed to a, an infrastructure service environment with VMs, or they're adopting software as a service in, a, in some sort of fashion for key tools yeah. they've been using, uh, that when they look to companies such as yourselves at, at Classria, they don't just want to know you're capable of doing it. They want to know that someone like AWS is actually certified you and go through the process. Um, I wonder if I could just quickly, just when you talk about some of these uh, processes you go through, just in very, very brief form, uh, what's that actual journey entail? What are some of the key steps when you go through that process of becoming, you know, gaining certification and, and you know, the, at the very front end through to the key steps? What, what does that entail? Yeah, it, it, exactly. So the, the, the AWS uh, migration and modernization company, actually, as it's now known, in, includes modernization. It's designed to um, identify and validate partners that have a proven technical expertise in, and, and actually customer success in this area. So really, it's a process that looks at the technical capabilities of the, pro of the product, and they will stringently put the product through its paces. Um, and, and, and this takes quite some time. There's many different layers of this validation um, some of which is actually done independently. Uh, so it really is put through its paces. Equally, from a customer success point of view, what they do is they look at the proof points that we have and success stories that we've got with uh, uh, Amazon as a destination um, from, a, from a cloud perspective. And what that does is essentially establish that we do have superior to technical capabilities in the product and that we've also got the, the expertise and the people skills behind that um, that supports a successful migration, um, and that's you know typically from any kind of environment to to AWS, different different services. It doesn't have to be just compute. Um, we can talk to that a bit later, but we we do some cool things in the product around looking at, at PaaS services. So really, it's a complete end-to-end -end process that vets the product and its capabilities. It looks at where we're going and the roadmap, but it also looks at how we actually leverage that product from a people perspective um, and, and the success that we've had in the market. Fantastic. I was actually recently reading uh, the 2021 market guide for cloud management tooling uh, by Gartner, which I know you were part of. Uh, mm -hmm. And I recommend our audience uh, tune into that via website. We'll have a link in the show description for that. Uh, and sure. particularly uh, looking at some of the expanding options that uh, infrastructure and information and, and operational people uh, need to be aware of with the rapidly evolving market. And, and it was a fantastic read and congratulations on being part of that. Thank you. The next thing that I, I wanted to get some insight from you with was, I guess, you know, when we, when you were talking earlier, one of the things that jumped out at me was the significance of Cloudsphere achieving both AWS migration and modernization competency. Um, and I guess one of the things, when we think about some of the underlying challenges in adoption of cloud, are, you know, I guess cybersecurity, uh, governance, compliance, regulatory challenges, from your point of view, why is it so significant that Cloudsphere has achieved both the AWS migration and modernization competency, as well as the AWS management tools competency in the cloud governance category? Yeah, well, look, I mean, just to kind of reemphasize, um, first and foremost, it's that level of validation, um, yeah. you know, that, that AWS have really performed due diligence against both of those products and, and the company. So that's the first thing, because really what that does is it means that we've gone through a process that other um, you know, software providers or solution providers uh, simply haven't. And whilst there's plenty of fantastic uh, vendors out there with really great products that have, you know, significant uh, traction and value that maybe haven't gone through that process, the point is it's designed to shorten the procurement cycle and the research cycle that customers will go through to find something that, you know, has been vetted. Um, and so it, it helps with that decision making. The second thing is that, um, if you look at the journey of, of cloud um, and you know it's been around for a long time now, so this isn't really nothing new, but migration clearly at the start of that journey is still absolutely significantly important to, to everybody because there aren't many organizations that have actually migrated everything that they would like to. Um, you know, typically it's a lot of the complex workloads now that that people are looking to perhaps move that they they didn't before. So migration is still front of mind um, for a lot of CTOs for sure. The second point is that for those um, instances and servers and, and, and products and services that you have migrated or that you've spun up as new in cloud environments, well, this is now looking at day two operations and day two operations is really about ensuring that you've got governance and controls and you're compliant with how you want to operate as a business or perhaps you've got a regulation in your industry. And so having um, some capabilities through tooling that gives you that visibility 
identifies threats, protects you from vulnerabilities. Misconfiguration is a big one that we're seeing all the time. Well, that's what that product's all about. And they're intrinsically linked. So the moment you identify and scan and, and unearth a particular application uh, using our discovery technology, that carries through to the governance side. And the, the fantastic capabilities of that is that you've got the context there that's incredibly important to make sure that you do have the right controls and governance and guardrails in place to make sure that you're protected from things like misconfigurations in the future. Indeed, you know, no matter, no matter how much we, we all like to think we're perfect, human error does slip in, whether we're tired, emotional, stressed, or just overworked. And certainly the last two years have, have, have highlighted a number of causes of that. And, and I've mm -hmm. personally fallen prey to that where a simple thing like a typo uh, has, has tripped me up and I haven't realized until it was nearly too late. And I think the scale okay. and the pace and the speed that we're working at now with, as you said, the, 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 the increased adoption of cloud and the, 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 mm. the speed at which we have to migrate, particularly with organizations adopting things like e-commerce solutions to deal with you know, the fact they couldn't run the retail business with the people in store for a while and had to spin things up. Um, things yeah. are done very quickly and sometimes all the checks and balances weren't done. The other thing that really struck me when you were talking about that was that I think for a lot of organizations looking to the likes of yourselves at CloudSphere and yourself in your role is that uh, this space is not really their core business. You know, if you're a bank, these cloud specialist skills are not necessarily their core business. They're a bank or if you're an airline or a transport or aviation company, you're consuming cloud services to run your core business. But cloud services right. and managing that is in your core business. And I think this is where it's so critical now to look to the likes yeah. of CloudSphere to get that support with the best of the breed. And, and the fact that you've gotten this essentially, you know, what I'd like to think of as a blue tick many ways, because when the when you look at the AWS marketplace, there are a lot of offerings and challenges, True. you know, who do you trust? Who can you trust now that you've got these, the, these, these um, you know, both of these uh, essentially uh, areas covered, particularly from the, the compliance area. I think this is a huge win for customers to now know that they can go to sleep at night banking on the fact that they can count on you to do this. One of the things yes. also I was keen to get a, a little insight on from you was um, a bit more detail about your actual over approach. When we think about CloudSphere's approach to discovery and planning for AWS migrations, what can you tell mm -hmm. us about that process? What can you tell us about that journey? Yeah, so there's a couple of uniques actually that we have during this process. Um, the, the first one is, I'm, I'm sure that the audience, the guys have heard of the, the six R's. Um, they're quite well known. It's a, it's really a framework um, that helps organizations kind of categorize the type of workload servers and, and applications into, I, I guess, categories of what you should do with them ideally as a starting point. So you've got things like replatform, refactor, retire, replace um, as an example. Um, and that's, that's a really good uh, process and framework to follow that helps you form a plan. And the first thing that we do is actually help form a plan. But the big difference with us when we look at the six R's, despite the fact that they're very well known, is we think they, they actually function better as, as purely as a starting point. It, it's not a destination. And there's a lot of organizations um, that will treat that as as the end of the journey, right? Oh, okay, you've cut you've categorized a bunch of servers down into replace. Um, but that's that's not enough. That's just the starting point, right? How are you actually going to do that? Um, and, and how are you planning for failure? Because inevitably, migrations hardly ever go smoothly. You know, that th there's so, so many dependencies involved and there's things like lack of knowledge and skills, even around applications that they built themselves. Um, you, you must plan for that. And, and having a tool that gives you that comprehensive insight and discovery uh, and forms a plan is is absolutely critical. And that's the first thing that we do is, is help form that plan. The other thing is, is actually on the, the sort of technical side in terms of how we actually gather the data. Uh, and and CloudSphere is a completely agentless solution. And the reason that's of interest is because naturally um, and traditionally technologies that would perform discovery use agents. So, you know, a bit of software, a runtime of some description that you would install on your servers intrinsically has one big issue in that it assumes you know what servers you want to install the agent on. <laughs> and by nature, we don't, right? This is the point. And, and, and discovery should be your initial source of truth of trying to understand what the lie of the land is, what applications are talking to other applications and where you have your interdependencies. And we are actually able to gather hundreds of different data points very, very quickly very scalably, you know, 100,000 servers at any one time within an instance of CloudSphere uh, agentlessly. And, and that means it's easier to install, it's faster to get the results that you need, and you don't have to go through the laborious process of trying to install agents, which is very, very painful. 
Um, so that's that's the other sort of point to mention. And the last thing really is our actual approach in terms of um, scanning, actually scanning a customer's estate. We have a unique approach, which we call top down discovery. And unlike a lot of um, legacy discovery tools that were actually, you know, asset based discovery tools, they start from what we call bottom up. So they'll look at IP addresses and they'll they'll sort of scan up from the IP uh, layer, looking at the server layer and then trying to understand what sits on top. And actually what we do is we start from top down and that means that we we simply need a seed of some description. So think of, it could be an IP address, it could be a host name, it could be um, the URL of a particular web service. It doesn't really matter where in the topology we start, we'll actually disseminate out and build from an application layer down. And this is really useful because straight away we get the boundaries of what makes up a particular application. And in fact, we actually work at a higher level of a business service. So we're actually looking at a much higher level grouping of what makes up a particular application and a business service. And, and that's really um, how we form such a robust plan very quickly that really helps customers move their migration forward and accelerate that. Uh, all too often we see, you know, um, processes or services going so far and then they're kind of having to fall back into using other tools or manual processes to kind of fill gaps and that that, that, that isn't really helpful um, so we look to try and automate as much as we can um, and, and ultimately this process allows us to add you know qualitative insights into our cyber assets it gives us that context that I mentioned before um, it allows us to map the interdependencies that minimize inefficiency in the migration process and it gives us a real sort of tactical view of allowing, you know, IT teams to manage workload placement, which is a key, a key point here uh, is about workload placement. It might be that cloud isn't actually optimum. Um, it might be that one cloud uh, for this particular workload is actually more suited to another for performance reasons, for instance, or, or data governance reasons. It's this kind of insight that we provide that we feel really does actually help um, support an enterprise with their migration. One question that came up while you were just talking there was um, the, the types of customers you work with, um, do they tend to come to you at some point and do an initial discovery process to discover where they're at because they've gone through a migration, they're partway through it at the end of migration, they kind of got a little lost because their IT service management mm -hmm. hasn't quite kept up the pace with it. Or, or do they come to you very early in that process before that to sort of figure out the assets they're going to migrate into the cloud? Or is it a combination yeah. of both? It is a combination. Naturally, um, you know, as we as we sort of talked about before, you've got a lot of organizations that have, of course, got, um, you know, quite considerable cloud spend. They, they, they're using cloud an awful lot. Um, they might even talk to what they call as a cloud first strategy. So when they're building out new, it's, it sits in the cloud. Um, but there's still a huge amount of organizations that um, haven't finished that migration. They, they, they tend to sort of be these big, big bang cycles that um, never really seemingly end. Um, yeah. And, and so there's organizations that are looking to undertake a new transformation. Um, you know, of course, we still come across customers that, that haven't actually adopted cloud yet, really. They, they might have some SaaS. Um, they might have a couple of new services or test services that they're sort of building. But in terms of migrating their, their existing, they're just about to undertake a transformation. Of course, we get those customers too, um, where they've engaged early, uh, but equally, we get a lot of stalled migrations, a huge number of them where, you know, they've gone through, they've hit some blockers, they don't know enough about a particular application, um, you know, maybe they've tried using some other tools, they they weren't happy with those, whatever the process may be, we, we do get a mixture of both stalled migrations that, that need some help, um, and equally those that are just about to start. Um, so we, we do get a combination. Right. Yeah, I imagine, as you said, there's a lot of uptake of, of, of what I would call classic SaaS, which is, you know, maybe a CRM or even Office 365 or Office Automation Tools, but some of their yeah. big heavy hitting environments like their ERP may still not have moved out of either a, a third party data center managed environment or, or some other uh, service. At yep. the other end of the spectrum, I, I imagine uh, you must also have companies that either implement your solution from a regulatory and uh, compliance and governance point of view for third party independent reporting, you know, maybe whether it's around data protection, data sovereignty, data locality, or maybe it's, it's part of a merger and acquisition process where <clears throat> they're just trying to figure out what assets they have and have to manage or own or protect 
or report it independently to someone, maybe for financial services, that, that yeah. must be a fairly important market for you where you, you're not only doing it from the service management internally for people running their own infrastructure, but they're also reporting externally with this independent tool. They could say, well, actually, this is what we've got and where it's at and the state of it. Yeah, exactly spot on. Absolutely. And what's really interesting there, you mentioned one use case in particular, which was mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and it's really interesting because that actually really comes up a lot. Um, and what's interesting when you talk to that that point is that we actually see pain on both sides because we're, we're uniquely positioned with the car migration piece and discovery, which offers but by the way, a sort of continuous ongoing value, but because it gives mm. you the, mm. the real insight picture rather than, you know, kind of, I guess, a, an A3 printout of what the uh, environment looked like maybe two months ago. It's not going to be the same now, especially in, in, in cloud environments where they're so dynamic. Um, it gives you that continuous visibility and that's a key word. Um, and so there's, there's issues with mergers and acquisitions from a migration perspective because you've got duplicate costs, you've got services that you need to integrate, they perhaps don't understand how they can or, or where they can just maybe retire something. So it's absolutely on that side of the fence. But to your point, on the governance side, absolutely. Um, it's it's mm, having that, mm. again, that visibility that we use from our discovery tool, which is part of the, the cyber asset management piece. Um, but then being able to report on that and looking at that and scrutinizing that data to say, okay, it's one thing just to sort of have sight and visibility on what that looks like. From an audit perspective, we can report on that. But actually, how are we doing for compliance? You know, what's the situation in terms of the configuration state today? Is that actually compliant? Do we need to update our policies? You know, we've we've seen all this sort of log four uh, vulnerabilities come out. So it's capabilities around that, being able to interrogate the environments that you have based on a particular use case. And of course, the solution supports all of those motions too. Indeed, and and I think that's going to become uh, you know almost exponentially more critical for organisations for both of those uh, use cases, I guess. And one is operational state of the nation as and uh, where we are in the health or infrastructure and our data, and then secondly the the, the independent reporting and so forth. Uh, I imagine the the last use case that I had in mind while you're talking about that was essentially you know because we've sort of talked about what the CIO and CTO might be worried about from the managing the technology and services. We've sort of talked broadly about what the chief risk officer might be worried about from M&A and assets. But I imagine also the CFOs are kind of looking at this from the point of view of what assets we've got and how do we put KPIs around them, put a value on them, get on our balance sheet. That's probably a use case I imagine that comes up occasionally well. People just saying, well, what are those assets and then what are they worth and where are they? And, and are we managing them from a commercial point of view? Because we talk about data being the new oil and data being an asset, mm. but often we don't know where it is and where, where it is, particularly when it's in the cloud. Is, is that a use case that comes up quite often for you? Yeah, absolutely. And look, let's let's be honest. You know, the, the, when you look at um, things like migration, for instance, there's there's always, um, you know, and having worked in this space, this specific space for a number of years, um, for me, uh, also having worked in other areas of technology, the, some of the compelling events that you see in this space are, are arguably the most compelling. I mean, you know, there's often real drivers, um, whether it be you know, regulation, compliance, vulnerability that we have in in the servers, the operating systems, the applications, or you mentioned some earlier about, you know, data center contract renewals or service agreement renewals, software going end of life and out of support. These are real drivers that need attention. Mm. And typically they're attached to the reason why um, organizations are looking to uptake the cloud. We know about the efficiencies. We know about the, you know, the ability, the speed, the agility that we get. Um, but there's also... You know the, the notion of organisations trying to remove their their sort of technical debt, um, and so that's that's very much part of of, of that journey. Uh, and and cost is you know always associated with that because quite often you know the, the sort of ramifications of not addressing those compelling events leads to unwanted cost, um, duplicate costs, and one of the pain points that we see in migration. If you imagine a sort of a, a chart with a, a timeline um, of the migration taking place is um, actually what we call the migration bubble. And what we try to do is shorten that as much as possible, because for, whilst that bubble exists, you've actually got duplicate environments, right? You're, you're migrating, essentially duplicating workloads if you're doing a lift and shift across to a new cloud environment. And whilst that's happening, you're still running those services. You're still keeping the lights on. Uh, and of course, when you see a, a migration stalled because of complexities and more investigation needed, et cetera, that's where costs really sort of venture out of um, 
forecast um you know mm. in control mm. so there's lots of different issues and challenges that we see with migration they, they're really not simple and equally on the cyber side you know there's there's costs of inaction there's costs of making sure that you are compliant you've got the governance you've got your configurations in place especially with your data um so we've we've yeah we kind of help with both sides of that fence in terms of the challenges that we see and uh, try and make it easier, right? It's not easy, but we, Indeed, we really try and make it easier. Indeed. Yeah. Well, no, it's exciting. I, I think, you know, it's that classic line of you can't uh, manage what you can't measure and, and, and in every possible way, it's clear that you can do that across the board. I also like the idea that there's this mental image that you've resolved the Donald Rumsfields and the no unknowns, no one unknowns and the unknown unknowns that you're going to be discovering those. And, and look, huge congratulations to yourself and the team there at Classphere on achieving Thank both you. the AWS migration modernization competency as well as the AWS management tools competency in the cloud governance category. I wonder if you could maybe wrap us up briefly with a, a little a forward looking uh, thinking here. If there was one key actual point you could share with our audience that you think they should be considering now, something they could perhaps uh, include as maybe a standing agenda item in, in the boardroom in light of what we discussed today or perhaps around cyber assets. What might that look like? What, what would you like folk to be thinking about and talking about in the short to medium term that they could potentially take away as an actionable thing, mm. uh, you know, including reaching out to yourselves at CloudSphere and starting a conversation as early as possible to, to get all the learnings and, and avoid the pitfalls you can help them with? What are some of the things that you might advise them at board level to sort of think about, think about this now rather than later and when yes. CloudSphere in particular could help them? Yeah, absolutely. I think that we, we touched on it before. And there's a key word that I like to use because I think it, it's, it's a very strong, powerful word and it applies to the use case that we've talked about and that's visibility. Um, so I, I think it's absolutely key that you try and quantify your cyber assets, both in your existing environments that, you know, if you're looking at a cloud transformation, some description, quantify the assets there, but absolutely make sure that you've got the right capabilities and tooling in instruments that are designed to provide visibility for the cloud. Because as you mature down the path of, of cloud technologies, um, you, you start moving and venturing off into products and services that you, you know, have control of, but you see less of, right? Because they're, they're managed services from the cloud providers. So visibility is key. The level of, um, you know, dynamic movement and, you know services being spun up and spun down also increases as you mature so having that visibility is absolutely key and and that's what i would suggest you try and do um is is quantify those assets both in existing environments if you still have them and certainly in your in your cloud environment and that will help costs it will help um you know uh, things like tagging which is of course a, a core principle in in the cloud to be able to understand and have visibility of your assets and of course it will help with cyber management too so that's probably the, the point I'd leave you with. No, fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, I think if, if any senior executive in a decision-making role in business to technology can't just hand on heart confirm to the board that they have full visibility, as you said, across all their assets, particularly cyber assets in the cloud, they need to be reaching out to you sooner or later and starting a conversation, whether they immediately become a customer or just have a conversation and begin that Absolutely. because, you know, if they, if they, they don't know what they've got in the way of cyber assets and how they're going to manage that and their potential risk becomes exponentially higher and higher over time as they adopt more, more services. Well, Keith Nelson, it's been absolutely fantastic to spend some time with you. Really great to learn about Thanks, your role Chris. as technical evangelist uh, there at CloudSphere. Loved learning more about your, your I guess, your approach to uh, AWS Cloud mig Migrations and some of the tools. And again, huge congratulations on both of the, the awards with regard to the competencies there. And, and it's going to make you a standout player in the AWS marketplace. And I'll certainly be keeping a close eye on it. And we'll look forward to having you back on the show again soon. I really appreciate your time. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Des. No, really appreciate you having me. So thank you so much.